glory, glory. That is awesome as it can be. I'm serious and so true and so true. How many of you have been through some valleys? Huh? You've been through them? Yeah, I know, yeah. They touch you. Somebody touch me. Glory to God, glory to God. When you get through counting, come on back because I need some of that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, holy Lord. You know, you've, you've, if you've been through a valley, you know what we're talking about, and you know what God does in valleys. Uh, most of us pray, and it's, I don't think it's wrong to pray that we don't have to go through valleys. You know, we want God to deliver us from the valley. But according to the Word, He, he really doesn't deliver us from the valley. He delivers us through the valley. He said, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me, and your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table in the very presence of my enemies. You anoint me with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yeah, God takes us through the valleys, and it's not always comfortable. It's hardly ever comfortable. It hardly ever makes any sense to us, but God keeps leading us one step at a time, you know, through it, and, and it's only when you get to the end, you know, looking out the windshield of life, you, you can't tell where you're going, but when you look in your rearview mirror, you see where you've been, and you go, God, you have, you've led me through this valley, and I kept me out of these ditches, and, and I'm, you know, I'm walking through it one step at a time, and that's God. That's the way God works. That's the way God blesses our life. It's not that God delivers his children from the, from the, the issues that everybody else deals with. It's that God carries us through that. It's that we've got a God that is with us, and goes with us and teaches us and moves us and, and guides us through all of these uh, shadows of valleys and fears and anxieties. Woo! Oh, well, God, I mean, that, that band just fires me up. I mean, they just, they can, I guarantee you, I, if I just came in here and had no idea what the Lord wanted me to share or anything about it, and I didn't have any handouts for you, and we didn't, weren't going into something specific, I believe that just after they got through leading us in praise and worship, I'd just, just take off on something. I, I usually do anyway, but there you go. You can preach on that a few minutes before I get to what I'm doing. I, I, I want to I get to this because if you have an outline in your hand, uh, for the, for today that, that I that I gave you, uh, you can see quite a few blanks to fill in on, on it, and uh, that means it just kind of has you know points, and then it has like little sub points, and then it has like little sub points from sub points, uh, and I don't want to I don't want it to sound complicated because this message is not complicated, it's really not, it's really very simple, it's a message about your heart, it's a message about uh, what's true about your relationship with God, and that is that. It's a relationship from the inside out. It does matter why you do what you do. This is what this sixth beatitude is all about. Let, as a matter of fact, let, let's just let's just jump right in and let's let's see. You know, we are in a series and we've we've read them all and we've been through uh, five of them before. Let's just kind of get to where we are now and seeing the multitudes. Jesus, he Jesus went up on a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, which really means blessed are those who realize their need for God. That's what poor in spirit is. It's not low self-esteem. It's not looking at yourself and saying, oh, I'm junk, I'm pitiful. No, it just means that you're humble. It means that you see yourself not as the king of everything, but as in need of God in your life. So you're blessed. You're happy when you see yourself like this, because God is going to let you inherit the, his kingdom. And it just goes on. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Not blessed are those who moan, but, but blessed are those who mourn. And mourn means legitimate grief. If you are legitimately grieving, which we know what that means. Uh, we, we have lots of things in our life that cause us to grieve. And it's legitimate grief. It's not, it's not self-centered moaning and belly aching and pity partying and all of that. It's legitimate mourning in life. God says, when you're like that, I can make you happy because I'm going to come with strength. That's what comforted means. God comes with strength to 
to get you out of that and to lift you up and to support you while you're moaning. Happy are the meek, or blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When you it, meek means strength under control, and this word meek, especially when it comes in, in, in to other people in life, so it, it's really saying you can be happy if you can control yourself against other people. They're going to give you a lot of reasons not to to blow up and to do all of that, but if you can uh, control your strength. And you can live within boundaries when, by the of the way you react to other people, then you, you're going to be blessed. God's going to let you in, inherit the earth now, and in the kingdom to come. That's a great, great word. And then verse six: Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But, but just Jesus is just saying, if you're hungry and thirsty for the things that really matter. The thing that really matters is right, being right with God. Righteousness means I want to be right with God. I want to live right. I want to think right. I want to do right. I want to be right. That's what righteousness really means. He said, if you're hungry and thirsty for the right things, you can be happy because I can feel you if you're hungry for the right stuff. The, 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 the point is, uh, quit eating spiritual junk food, you know? I mean, quit really chasing that which doesn't really fill you up in life and get hungry for the real thing and, and God can work in your life. And then, blessed are the merciful last week for they shall obtain mercy. And that just simply means if I give mercy, I'm going to get mercy. If I give good words, I'm going to get good words. If I give friendship, I'm going to receive friendship. Jesus is ju just saying what you give out, th uh, that's what you're going to give back. If you give out gossip, you're going to, people are going to gossip about you. If, if you give out uh, uh, negativism, then uh, people are going to be negative about you. Uh, it's a direct return. It's, uh, you give it, you, you get it back in life. So if you want to get mercy, then uh, give out mercy in life and you'll, you'll get it back. And then today, uh, the sixth beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall be God, shall see God. And it talks about our hearts and being pure in our hearts. And if we're pure in our hearts, we're going to get to see God. Well, as Americans and really all around the world now, because we see everything on the internet and everything about, uh, the rest of the world, they're probably just as bad as we are in a lot of things. You know, we want to drink we, about purity. We want to drink pure water. Um, how many of you? How many of you have a water purifier of some type in your home? Yeah, it may be under your sink, and it purifies the cold water side of your sink, so you don't have to drink that chlorine taste and all that. Or it might be in your refrigerator, where you get it out of the front of your refrigerator, but it goes through a filter, and it tastes way better because it filters the chlorine or the you know, or the iron or whatever it might be out of it. Yeah, we we spend billions of dollars every year in America to drink pure water because we're interested in that, and to breathe pure air. Yeah, some of us buy air purifiers and humidifiers and everything else, and we, you know, we have vacuum cleaners that uh, purify the air when it when you vacuum with them and all of that kind of stuff, because we want to breathe pure air, and then uh, we want pure foods, right? In, in, in the grocery store, and, and I'm gonna kind of maybe bust a little bit of a bubble here, and I, I hope I don't make anybody mad, but you know, we we in the grocery store they have a section called organic foods, right? Now, the thing you notice about organic foods is it's always, it's always more expensive, right? Yeah, organic foods implying what? That implying that organic foods are better for you than non-organic foods, and that organic foods are more pure than, than the non-organic foods. But that's not true at all. What organic foods means is a different type of fertilizer has been used on these crops than on these crops. They're not, any, they're not any pure, they're not any stronger. They may taste a little better or different depending on how your taste buds respond to things, but it just means manure has been used on these. Organic, that's what organic means. It means fertilized out of you know, some animal has been used on that. And on these, uh, fertilized out of a sack has been used on these. Triple 13, triple eight, you know, whatever it might be. And, and that's really the only difference, but this costs way more because the, the, the advertisers and the, and the merchants know that we are interested in pure food. So as, as, um, 
as important as having pure air and pure water and pure food is, there's one sense of purity that I think most of us miss in our lives. We tend to miss it. And it's, it, it, it's brought to our attention in this sixth beatitude where Jesus says that happiness is a heart condition. Look at your neighbor and say, it, it, it comes out of your heart. Now, Jesus says, Jesus says, you want to be happy? Happiness is from the inside out. Uh, what, does, what does pure in heart mean? Pure in heart means unmixed motives is what it means. It means, it means that my motives are pure. My motives are true. That I, I, I don't say one thing and then I do another thing. That, that I, have, I have integrity. I, I, I can be trusted because I'm the same on the outside as I am on the inside because my motives are pure. My heart is pure. So God is very concerned about your motives. I know, this is, see, this is one area we never really think much about in life, that God is not in, only interested in what we do. God is interested in in why we do what we do. So God tells us in, in Matthew 5, in this sixth beatitude, that we need to understand that, that in order to be happy, we're going we're gonna to need to be the same on the outside as we are on the inside. The next chapter, chapter 6 of Matthew, and we're going to read a few verses out of chapter 6 because chapter 6 is all about this. There is, is Jesus saying, let me show you what I mean. I'm going to give you some examples. And in the first verse of the next chapter, he says, all right, uh, take heed that you don't do your charitable deeds in front of other people so that they can see it because if you do it for the purpose of letting other people see it, then you are not going to get any reward. You already have your reward. Hey, listen, is it possible to do good things with wrong motives? Is that possible? Sure it is. Well, is it possible to be outwardly religious and, and inwardly a mess? <laughs> yeah, sure it is. So Jesus says you can be happy when you're the same on the, on the inside as you are on the outside. You're the same. You, you have unmixed motives. You're not all crossed up in what you do and what you say not being the, the same. So how can I be pure in heart? That's the question. Hey, all right, pastor, I can be happy if I'm pure in heart. Well, how can I be pure in heart? What will help me to develop my life so that I can be uh, 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 the real thing and be the same on the inside as I am on the outside and be the same on the outside as I am? Well, all right, we're going to examine three truths in chapter 6, which is obviously the next chapter of Matthew, and, uh, and we're going to get a chance to see what, uh, what, what Jesus says about this. That's that take heed uh, passage. All right, here's the first truth. The first truth is remember that God sees everything. All right, remember that God sees everything. Now, I didn't say they were going to be sexy, okay? I just said they're going to help you, all right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not a, you know, you, you would think anybody knows this, right? Remember that God sees everything. In chapter 6 of Matthew, there's a key phrase. It just keeps getting used over and over. And the phrase is, he that sees in secret, he that sees in secret uh, will reward you openly uh, uh, in chapter 6. Implying what? That God see you can't hide anything from God. In the fourth verse, just to show you what I mean, it says, uh, when you do your char charitable deed, uh, do it in secret so that your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And then down in, in, in verse 6, he's talking about praying. And I know you've read these passages and you've seen them and heard them before. He says, when you pray, go into your, your, your closet. And when you shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And then down in verse 18, that same chapter, he starts talking about fasting. Now, do you know what fasting is? You know, fasting is when you go without food so that you can pray, right? 
It means you don't eat food. Instead of eating food, you take that time to pray. It means that's how serious you are. It means that you sacrifice something that's really valuable to you and what you want to do. And there are a lot of people that fast three days, seven days, 40 days. I fasted before. I think the longest I've ever fasted is probably like 21 days. And um, the Daniel fast, the Daniel, you've done 40. We've, we've done 40. Well, you got to be dog serious before you do 40. Now, I'm serious. You, you can, uh, yeah, you can drink. You, you didn't lose one pound. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's, that may be absolutely what happened. But you can drink water, but you can't, you know, eat. But anyway, that's fasting. Fasting is a, a, a spiritual thing. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep kind of prayer. You know, Jesus, when he was talking about casting out some demons, he told his disciples this kind I mean, the stubborn kind, this, this, this big boy demon, stubborn kind, this kind comes not out but by prayer and fasting. You know, in other words, you're going to have to put on your big boy britches to cast these demons out because they they're, they're tough. They have a tough hold, and they gotta, you got to fast. You've know, you got to do above fast. But, but here's what Jesus said. He said, when you, when you fast, don't look like you're fasting. You know, I, I mean, if I'm fasting and I'm all miserable and slow and down in the dumps. And, and so you come up to me and say, man, what is wrong with you? You look like you're just all beat down and tired. And, I, and, you, and you say, well, I'm fasting because I really need a miracle in my life. Well, you've lost it. You lost it. Jesus said, when you fast, don't look like to other men that you're fasting. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly so the, 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 the discernment here is, uh, is that uh, God sees everything. So God's not surprised and nothing is ever a secret to God. Does that bother you, by the way? <laughs> nothing is ever a secret to God. Sometimes it does bother me. I'm going <laughs> to say that to you, you know. I mean, let's be real about it. There are some things I would rather God not know, right? Yeah. I mean, come on, Holy Ghost. I mean, be, be, be right at least in church, all right? You know, it's kind of like children. You, you know how a toddler hides? Yeah, you that have had toddlers and grandchildren and toddlers. You, know how, you remember how a toddler hides, right? You, he's toddling around out here or something, and you're saying, where's Bubba, where's Bubba, where's Bubba? And Bubba's got his hands over his eyes like this. You know why? Because he thinks if he can't see you, you can't see him. Right. Well, that's okay for a toddler who's hiding, but there are lots of folks that treat God that way. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they think, oh, well, sometimes because they can't see God, 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 God can't see you. Have you ever had the devil tell you, go ahead, man. God will never know. Nobody will ever know. Go ahead and do it, man. Ain't nobody going to know but me and you, and, and I ain't telling anybody, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I got a surprise for you. God already knows what you're doing. And Hebrews 4, look at what Hebrews 4, I love this phrase in here. It sounds so poetic. I just love the way it says, neither is there any creature. And for complete disclosure, I, that parenthesis is what I, I, I put that in there, all right? That, that's not in the original scripture. It's that's something I put in there. But neither is there any creature, including us, that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I love that. That sounds so well. Naked and open to him with which we have to do in life. That's just simply saying that I may fake out others. Others may, I mean, I can put the moves, I can, I can shimmy, I can do, I can, I can, I can fake them out. I can, I can get them looking over here and go the opposite direction. I, I can fake, I can move, I can jut, I can strut, I can lie, I can deceive and all of that kind of stuff, but I can't fake God out. So I might as well go ahead and be honest because I, 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 God knows everything. The one who sees in secret shall reward you openly or he already knows. You know, what the, but you know what the amazing thing is? The amazing thing is he knows everything about me and yet he still loves me anyway, <laughs> my Lord. I mean, that's the amazing thing. When you are at your stinking worst, God is at his glorious best. 
when you are as low as you can be and as sorry as you can be and as reprobate as you can be and as wicked as you can be and as rebellious as you can be, God sees every bit of it. God hears you curse his name. God sees you turn your back. God, God, God feels you spit on him and walk away from him. And he still reaches out his arms and says, come on, son, let me love you anyway, in spite of all of that. That's what the cross is all about, my goodness. Oh, Lord, yeah. So one thing that'll help me develop a pure heart is to remember that God sees everything. All right, here's the second truth. I said there were three of them. Here's another one, all right? I must regularly review my motives. Okay, that, I know that doesn't sound very sexy either. Mm. That's not a stand up and clap verse, right? All right, I remember that God sees everything. Second way to help me develop a pure heart is to review regularly my motives. In other words, I, I do an honest evaluation on why I do what I do. I said an honest evaluation on why I do what I do. Why do you do what you do? Well, it, it, it's really important because like Proverbs 16 says that all the ways of a man is clean in his own eyes, but God judges the motives of his heart. In other words, if, I, if I'm not really honest with myself, I can deceive myself into why I do certain things. But God is going to evaluate me, and my reward is going to be based on what God sees in me, not what I allow myself to be deceived by. Why? I mean, it's really important that you, that you get your why I do it and your I did it all lined up because your reward in life is based on not what we do so much, but, but why, we, why we do it. And Matthew 6 is really about all the, 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 the things about why we do what we do. Let me show you what I mean. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 gives us three examples of, of good things that can be done in the wrong way. And if we do good things in the wrong way, it's going to be a mess up. And the first thing that he talks about is about giving. And, and let me show you what he says about giving. Uh, verse 2, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, uh, they have their reward. So Jesus is saying, all right, don't give to be seen by other people. Don't give with the motive of other people seeing you give and being impressed by how much you give. Now, uh, you know, if you want to do this, uh, you can borrow my shofar and, and you can see what it means. You know what, it, what it's talking about? It's talking about the hypocrites he's talking about are the Pharisees. That's who he's talking about. And, and he says, you know what the Pharisees do? A lot of times the Pharisees give an offering. They take up an offering. And, and as the offering box goes down, or maybe as they walk in front of the offering box, uh, when w- one of those Pharisees who's going to give a pretty good amount of money, uh, when he gets to the offering box, he goes, you know, like this, he goes. And then everybody looks and he goes, I just wanted y'all to see how much I'm giving. <laughs> Glory to God. That's right. Some of you guys need to get up off of it, and you need to give like me and be blessed like me. And then, and, and Jesus said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't do that kind of stuff. Because if you do that kind of stuff, the only reward you're going to have is that you're seen by others, and, and that's all the reward you're going to get. Look, look at this passage, next, three, three and four. But when you do a charitable deed, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. In other words, don't even talk to yourself when you give. Have you ever talked to yourself when you've given before? Oh, I was, uh, I was wonderful today. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I was generous today. Oh, I'm such a good person. I, I, I do what I need to do. And oh, it, it's wonderful. I put in the whole $5 today. And I'm such a generous soul. I'm such a blessed person in life. And you just pat yourself on the back. 
Jesus said, you have your reward. That's the only reward you're ever going to have is you're patting yourself on the back. So see, in giving, it matters not only what you do, but how you do it, why you do it. Here, here's another example, prayer. Jesus talks about prayer in Matthew 6, and here's what he says. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street and, and on the corner of the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. In other words, uh, when you pray, you, you, you get out in front of people and you pray for the show of it. It's what it boils down to. Have, have, you, ever, have you ever heard anybody uh, pray to the congregation? Now, you may not know what I'm talking about, but in, in a lot of churches, you know, we have like the bulletin says uh, prayer. Well, that means somebody has to pray. So a lot of times in, in, in churches, they'll have somebody in the congregation pray. You know, some designated person. And that person just gets up and with all these kind of flowery words and all of this uh, sophisticated sound and language, they just pray this real flowery type prayer with all these uh, f fancy words. Uh, our, our heavenly Father, thou that sitteth above the sapphire seal of grace, put thy, we pray that thou would endeavor to clothe us in the Shekinah glory of God. And we pray that thou would, would cover us with the wings of thy mercy and thy good, you know. And whenever they get through, you, wanna, you, you actually want to just stand up and go, wow, holy God, that was awesome in prayer, you know? Because, boy, it just sounded magnificent, and it was wonderful, and it impressed you a lot. Jesus said, when you pray, eh, don't do that. And then have you ever heard anybody pray and give the announcements when they pray? Have you ever heard that, you know? God already knows what's happening. He doesn't need to know what's happening. But everybody else needs a word. And God, we pray that you'll help us to remember that tonight at 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall, that, Lord, we're going to have a meeting of the nursery committee, and, Lord, may we all be there tonight because it's very important that we all be there because we're trying to decide. And you just pray like that, and you're giving an announcement in the middle of your prayer. God said, Jesus said, don't pray like that. Or have you ever heard anybody pat themselves on the back when they pray? I mean, really, it's kind of very subtle, but what they're really doing is they're telling you how devoted they are. Like, you know, Lord, uh, I want to thank you for the 15 people that I witnessed to this week and that glorious mercy to allow 15 lost people to come across my path and for me to have enough courage to witness and, and try to win them to faith in you, Lord. I mean, or thank God for something that they prayed all night and God gave them something. Lord, I thank you that this tonight, last night when I was praying and staying up all night, Lord, staying up all night in prayer, that about 3 o'clock in the morning, Lord, you spoke to my heart and you gave me some word at 3 o'clock. And Lord, I just thank you for that. Yeah. Really, it's just bragging on themselves. But they're letting you know it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah. Could you imagine me getting to my, my prayer blanket and going down to the Walmart parking lot and getting down there and spreading my blanket out in the Walmart parking lot? Well, first thing, I'd probably get run over, you know, by, down there by something. But let's just say I didn't get run over. They'd probably call the police or somebody like that and try to haul me up out of there. But let's just say they would let me do it and I could put my prayer blanket down in the Walmart par parking lot uh, and I just get down on my blanket and I just start praying and everybody that walks by looks at me and said, oh, there's Pastor Keith. Isn't he such a wonderfully devoted, wonderful man of God? Because look at him. He's so dedicated to praying that he's praying right there. Jesus said, don't do that. That's fake. That's phony. That's fraudulent in life. And that's an example of doing something good for the wrong reason and your blessing being lost by that. He, he, he talks about one other thing in here, and it's fasting. So he talks about giving, he talks about praying, he talks about fasting. These are three good things that can be done in the wrong way, and you lose your, and you lose your blessing. All right, look at this one. This one is, is one of those things where the Lord just uh, speaks straight to us. Moreover, when you fast, don't, do not be like the hypocrites with sad countenance. In other words, when you're fasting, don't look like you're fasting. Have you ever fasted? Has anybody in here ever fasted? Let me just see who I am. See who I'm talking to. Okay. 
All right, so it's a pretty good little representative bunch in here. That's good. That's great. Now, it's not telling you don't fast. It's just telling you when you fast, don't do this, all right? Moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you that they have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head. That means get some mousse, put it in your hair, right? Yeah, get your hair spray out, get, you, get it fixed just like it looks like always, not like you're sad and worn out and, uh, you know, and, and, and you look like the poster for malnutrition or something, you know. <laughs> you got the bags under your eyes. I mean, do, get yourself all dolled up, put your makeup on, get the mousse up in your hair, anoint your, anoint your uh, head and wash your face. Yeah. Don't, don't get that false kind of look uh, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. In other words, look like you always look so that nobody asks you, are you fasting? But, but to your father who is in, in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. What, what, what's the point of this? The point of it, Jesus says, is that, is that, is that you would be Pure in heart. Well, what is pure in heart? Pure in heart means, can I keep it a secret when I do good stuff? Huh? I mean, can, can, can I hold it in and nobody know about it but me and God when I do something good? Or do I just have to blab about it, you know, so that somebody will know what a good, solid person I am? He says, what, what is your motivation for this? Are you doing it so that men can see you? Are, are you more interested in the applause of men rather than the favor of God? Do you have to just tell? I mean, it slips out so easily, doesn't it? When you do something good, right? You're at, you're at men's night, let's say, and, the, and everybody's in there and they're talking about little different things and, and you know, you, you kind of get let it go and then you, you mention something, you know, you, you let it slip out. Well, guys, when I was praying the other night about three o'clock in the morning, God spoke to me. And, uh, uh, well, you did, it just slipped out, right? You, you really wanted somebody to know how dedicated you were and how awesomely religious you were. So you couldn't keep quiet about it. It couldn't just be between you and God. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's, that, that, that's, the, that's the point of what chapter 6 is talking about. Look, of the broader point, the broader point would be, don't be a hypocrite. Yeah, because hypocrites don't have any reward with God. You know what the, ha the opposite of pure in heart is? The opposite of pure in heart is a hypocrite. Jesus said about the Pharisees, the Pharisees loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Well, if you love the praise of men more than the praise of God, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get the praise of men. <laughs> and, that, and, and, and that's all that, that you get. So the question then becomes, do I, do I want to, who do I want to please the most? Do I want to please other people the most or do I want to please God the most? Do I do what I do for the praise of men? Because if I do, that's all I'm going to get is the praise of men. Or do I do what I do for the favor of God? Do I rather have the praise of men or would I have, rather have the favor of God? That's really the question right there. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I tell you, I've been both of those, and I'm telling you, the favor of God is way more awesome than the praise of men. The praise of men is about the most fickle thing that you've ever seen in your life. You can be the hero one second and the zero the next second. You can be the most up in the world one minute and the most down in the world the next. Man, people are fickle. I'm serious as I can be. You can be, you can be on top of the world and then at the bottom of it uh, in, in a moment's notice. That's the way people are. People, you know, they're just people. But the favor of God, we say it all the time, the favor ain't fair, right? You know what that means? That means that when God favors me and God blesses me, uh, it's not fair. 
because it's going gonna, it's gonna to elevate my chances, my choices, my opportunities. Whatever it is that I've, I'm concerned about, God's going to kind of just uh, bump, up, bump it up a little bit. That's, that's the favor of God. That's what he says. He said, if you are pure in heart, you're going to get to see God. And when you see God, that's going to make you happy in life. And he said, seeing God, let me, let me just ask you, would seeing God work in your life? Would seeing God answer prayers in your life? Would seeing God work in the lives of your children and the lives of your family and the lives of the people you love, would seeing God do that, would that, would that bump you up? Would that, would that, would that uh, excite you? Would that, would that motivate you? Would that make you happier? Would that take some of the load and some of the pressure? I actually see God working in my life. Holy Ghost, it is true. God works in my environment and my life. Would that take some pressure off of you? Sure it would. Sure it would. I'm going to tell you something. If you ever see God work in your life, you'll never forget it. I guarantee you ask anybody. You, know, you don't really have to ask anybody. If I just said, all right, stand up and give a testimony as to what God's done in your life, you'd begin to hear people and, and something that God did back 15 years ago, they still hadn't forgotten about it. It's so impactful. It's so dynamic. It's so amazing. You'll never forget it. It's that deep. It's that, it's, that, it's that spiritual in your life. And Jesus said, you want to be happy? That's how you be happy. You see God working in your life, and that'll make you happy. But he says, it's all wrapped up in your motives. It's all wrapped up, not just in what you do, but why you do them in life. Let me give you one more thing that'll help you uh, with, with develop in your life, and that is <clears throat> I must realign my authority, my my, my uh, priorities. Mm. All right, I remember see, God sees everything. I regularly evaluate my motives, and if I want to be pure in heart, I'm going to have to realign. I'm going to have to realign those priorities that are out of whack, okay? That, that, that's not, you know, that may not sound very much, but it's really important because if they're out of whack, that means I got to get them back in line. In Exodus 20, we have a, a, a listing of some commandments from the Lord, right? Let me ask you something. Does God still expect us to live by those 10 commandments that he gave there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody asked Jesus, he said, did you come to destroy the law? In other words, you come to get rid of the commandments? Did you come to get rid of uh, all those Old Testament things and all that kind of stuff? And Jesus said, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't come to get rid of it. I came that it might be fulfilled through me. And matter, matter of fact, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, you thought that was tough. You listen to what I say, it's going to be way tougher than that. He said, as a matter of fact, just show you what I mean. He said, that law right there says if you commit adultery, that you'll die. He said, I'm telling you, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you committed adultery. <laughs> How about that? He just intensified it. He didn't take them away. He made them worse. You know why? To show us we, we can't live by that. We got to have grace. But the first commandment, you remember what the first commandment is? The first commandment is, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the wilderness. And then he says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So the first commandment was, all right, don't have any other God before me. So I'm going to get first place in your life. I'm going to get the highest priority in your life. Um, I'm not going to play second fiddle in your life. You musicians will appreciate this little phrase I remember. I think you will. If you're not a musician, it probably won't mean anything to you, but it's just a little phrase. It's harder than I can tell to play the second fiddle well. Yeah, to play second fiddle is a difficult thing to do, isn't it, right? Well, I'm just going to tell you something. God ain't playing second fiddle to anybody. God's not, God's not going to play second place to your wife or your children or your girlfriend or your job or anything else. God works only in first place in your life is what he says. I'm going to be the top priority or I'm not going to be there in your life. That's what the Bible teaches us, that God is number one. Now, you might say, well, good, all right. 
I don't have any other gods in my life. I don't have any little idols out on my front yard. I've built no statues. I don't get down and bow before anything and worship, and I don't worship any other gods before the Lord God, to which I would just simply ask you, well, um, what is a God? Well, I tell you what a God is. A God is anything that takes priority in your life. Yeah. Well, how do I know what are the priorities in my life? Let me just, just hit this real quick. You say, all right, how do I know if something is taking the place of God in my life? This is how you know. Number one, I look at my activities. So you give me your checkbook and you give me your calendar of events and what you go to, what you do, and I can pretty much tell you what is the most important thing in your life because I look at what you spend the most time doing and the most money doing, and I can say that is the most important thing in your life. Now, I'm not talking about going to work. We all have to go to work. I'm not talking about stuff like that. I'm talking about your discretionary time. I'm talking about the time that you can choose what you do and how much money you spend on those kind of things. Because the things that, the things that I put my investment in are the things that are most important in my life. And don't, look, don't take my word. Look, Jesus said it in Matthew 6, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up treasures uh, for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Look at this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Isn't that interesting? Most of us would think it would be the other way around, Right? Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. That's the way we quote that thing most of the time. It's wrong. That's not what it says. It does not say where your heart is, that's where you put your treasure. It says it just the opposite. It says where you put your treasure, your heart's going to follow your treasure. This is why God asks us to tithe. Not because God needs the money. How many of you know God doesn't need your money, right? He doesn't need my money. He doesn't need your money. Why does he say tithe then? He says tithe because we need to show every week what is first place in our life. That's what tithing is all about. God doesn't need the money. God just needs for you to, to demonstrate every week what is the most important thing in your life? It, the fact that God blessed you to earn it, the fact that God gave you the opportunity to earn it, the health to earn it, the favor to get the job, the favor to hold the job, the favor to learn how to do the job. God opened the door so you could have the job. And God says, are you going to recognize me or not? Are you going to show that I'm first priority in your life? I, I, you take the first 10% of your money not the bottom 10, not what's left over, not after you pay your credit card bills and you pay your everything and your gas money and your grocery money. You take the first 10% of your money, and I've had people say, well, is that gross or is that net? In other words, that before or after taxes. And all I say to you is it just depends on how you want to be blessed. You want to be blessed gross or you want to be blessed net? You know, that's really all it boils down to. Yeah. So anyway, you take the first 10%, and on the first day of the week, you take the first part of your money, and you put it in an, in an offering box so that you can say and be reminded that God is first place in your life. Your activities show what's a God in your life. You don't, oh no, you don't have a statue out in your front yard or in your bedroom somewhere. You got it in your heart. That's where your statue is. That's where the most important thing you, you serve is. And God says, it, it, it better not be another God to you. All right? Look at your anxieties. Your anxieties just mean simply what you worry about. And let me just say it because time's run out. Um, it tells you don't worry about your life or your food or your drink or what you wear and all that kind of stuff. It just basically says uh, the things I worry about show what's really, um, what's really deep in my life. 
and don't, you know, don't worry about anything. God says, don't worry about it because I got it. And if you worry about it, it just means you're not trusting me. It just means that you're doubtful about me. It, it's really an issue of, do I believe God? Do I believe God's going to do what he says? And then look at my ambitions. And my ambitions are what I want in life, where I'm going in life, my goals in life. What do I want to be? What do I want to accomplish? What do I want to, how do I want my family to be? What is, what is the goal? What, what, what is my life all about? Because what your life is about reflects what's important to you and what's highest in your life. Yeah, I mean, you know, the trouble with most Christians, and I'm, I'm just being honest about it, the, the trouble with most Christians is that uh, we have the same ambitions as the world has. And because we have the same ambitions that the world has, we have the same pressures and we have the same uh, stresses in life and we have the same problems in life because we're seeking the same thing that the world is seeking. So God says, if you want to be happy, be pure in heart because when you get pure in heart, that's where you're going to see God. What does pure in heart mean? I think I got three things up here for you. Yeah. It means I'm continually conscious of God's presence. That means I see God work in my life. It's a mark of maturity. The more aware that God is with you all the time, the less conscious you are of other people around you. You're tuned in on trying to please God, not others. Who is it that I want to please? You've heard the phrase, you can't please everyone. And is that true? Sure. Well, do you want to please God? Um... Uh, uh, does, does, does God, uh, pleasing God only simplify your life? If you say, all right, a goal in my life is to pray, is to please God. That, that, that's, that's, it, does that bring the pressure down in your life? Well, it should, and it makes you happier. And then I'm content with if God's praise just simply means I want a reward from God. Uh, I, I'm not looking for the applause of men. I'm not looking for the praise of men. Because the praise of men is a, is a poor reward, isn't it? It's really a cheap, cheap reward, and, it, and, and it's so fickle. So would you rather have a temporary reward, or would you rather have a permanent reward? That's what God's asking. And if you say, I want a, I want a permanent reward, then all you have to do is to please God. You know, you're not running around trying to find the latest fads and the latest things that will impress people that are around you because that's not your, that's not your goal in life. Your goal in life is to please God. Your goal in life is to make God number one in your life. And Jesus said when you choose motives like that, it brings the stress down. It brings the pressure down in life. And because you can please God by making him number one. That's all that matters to him is that he be first place in life. Third thing I can expect is I'm controlled by God's priorities. I'm, in other words, my heart is set on what God says. And what God says is important, not what other people say. Now, you know, you know uh, this church uh, has been here for 12 years. The first couple of years of our life, our motto was, we're a great church if you can find us. That, cause we, we lived out of a trailer, right? Yeah, yeah we, had a, we had a trailer. We pulled around all this, everything, the sound equipment, the chairs, I mean, everything, uh, nursery equipment, uh, children's gear, everything. We loaded in a trailer, go up, set it up, have our stuff, take it down, go home. Two years we did that. Bump from place to place, rented places and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and so that's the way we lived our life. And, and our motto was always, uh, we're a brand new thing. Mm -hmm. Don't you see it? We've, God says, I've already begun. Already. Don't, don't you see it? <laughs> yeah, don't you see what I'm doing already? And I'm going, well, God, yeah, the... And, and I think one of, the, one of the things, and I'm not saying that other churches don't have this also, but one of the things that I think God has done in this place is that uh, we're a church that wants to please God. I mean, that's just really simply all it is about it. You say, why do you guys do what you do? Because we want to please God. 
Because we're not, we're not out here trying to uh, be on a big show for men and a big you know, production for everybody to see and say, come on in because we're the greatest and we're the most special and all that kind of stuff. It's just basically, look, if you want to see God and you want God to love you and you want to be at a place where people will love you and won't judge you and you can walk in and feel at ease and feel comfortable because everybody there has the same motive and the motive is to please God and because we only care about what God thinks. We're not, we're not interested in what other people might say about us. And so what is the result of that kind of uh, living of life? Uh, happiness. Because we're not all mixed up about your direction. You don't have to worry about being found out. Yeah, you know, when you're a hypocrite and you're a phony, one of the things you worry about is that people will find out who the real you is, right? That you steal, you, you're in a closet, you're hiding, you're not real, you're fake. And you're always worried about, man, somebody's going to find out, oh, Lord, it's going to be terrible. Uh, well, that's, that anxiety makes you unhappy, that brings you down, and you can't be happy. And Jesus said happiness is when you don't have to worry about being found out because you have a pure heart. And when you see God work in your life, in your circumstances, in your eternity, doesn't that lighten the load in your life? Sure it does. Yeah, so what does that? Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those people with unmixed motives because they're going to see God. You know, you cannot see God with a dirty heart. Now, I know your question would be, okay, well, how do I clean up my heart? Well, may I say to you that you can't clean up your heart. Does that surprise you? You can't do it. So I'm going to have to recommend a specialist to you. I'm going to recommend a heart specialist named Dr. Jesus. And Dr. Jesus has never lost a patient. And Dr. Jesus has never uh, failed to make house calls. And Dr. Jesus' bill has already been paid. And Dr. Jesus has, has always welcomed people, and he's a specialist, and he specializes, guess what? in heart transplants. And all I can say is, I'm a satisfied customer. And I can recommend Dr. Jesus to you because everything I just said about him is true. So I'm, I'm going to ask you, what kind of heart do you have today? A broken heart? A hard heart? A divided heart? A misplaced heart? A hypocrite heart? What kind of heart do you have? What, what, why don't you let God give you a new heart? I mean, isn't it time to stop pretending? I mean, isn't it time to get real and, and see God? Be pure in heart? Allow God to use you. Just, just bow your head with me one moment, would you please?